Texas Albany. Everybody familiar with that? We we buy Albany, but we have our own Albany. It grows way down at the far south of Texas. Uh, turn on down here, and I'll show you where it grows. There's there's a map. Uh, come down one or two right there. See, that's the only place in Texas it grows. Very tip of Texas. And here's what it looks like. It's kind of a brown dark. In fact, it looks almost like walnut from a distance. The difference is is how hard it is. I'll get into wood hardnesses here in a minute on the thing. Uh, Texas Albany, though, is a beautiful wood. If you can find a bigger enough piece, and that's the problem. Also, it's sort of like mesquite. When it grows, it tends to crack, have all kinds of knots or hollows in it. So it's not. It's hard to find a good big piece to turn something out of, and if you do, you want to turn it when it's green because it is so hard your tool will not touch it when it's dry. But it's beautiful, so it's worth the effort. Next slide. So if we can't have Texas Elmney or remember what I showed you, what Gaboon Elmney cost, $110 a board foot, what's our alternative as woodworkers? Well, I got to thinking the other day, so I've done a little research. This is what I call research. I get in the shop and play around. Anybody ever do that? Some of these woods I'm talking to, talking about, I just took the pieces of wood and glued them together. And what I wanted to know is which wood, piece of wood would absorb a dye, or if it was going to albinize the wood, turn it black, what wood would absorb the dye better than the other? You know what I found out? Apparently, don't make any difference. If y'all look at this, it, it, they all, if you look at them, I'm trying to get them up here where y'all can all see them. And uh, there's a slide, but I, I don't know if you can tell much about it, but all of them pretty well look about the same to me. What do y'all think? Okay. Uh, sorry, I got this in backwards. They all absorb the dye. This and I use that little old alcohol dye in a bottle, transit dye, here's the name of it, to color it. What you're seeing is one coat, two coats, three coats, and then polyurethane. Notice it didn't turn black till you put the polyurethane or, or a finish on it. So they took that to turn it black because it was kind of brown, that dye, until that point. Then I found out the other thing. Y'all see this, this marks right here and here? put a piece of tape on it and then ripped it off. Finish come off. This is a dye, so we can't sand it or we're going to sand through the dye, but polyurethane won't stick to this transit dye. One of the, my wood turning friends suggested that maybe I ought to put lacquer on it since the dye is a lacquer based, I mean a, a alcohol based dye. And thing. I don't know, I didn't get that far, <laughs> but that's something to think about. So anyway, a dye though colors wood, soaks in and colors wood. As an alternative to that, there's a pigment dye. And that is colored pigments that are actually introduced in the wood. So I turned it over and I played with them a while. And what I found out is, again, coat, one coat, two coat, three coats, polyurethane over them. Isn't that much prettier? That is, that's the, that is a black dye that they use to albinize wood floors. It's a pigment dye. You put it on there, you wait three minutes, and you wipe it off, the excess off. And then you got to wait 24 hours for it to die, so, uh, dry, so it goes slower than an alcohol thing. But put a piece of tape on there, stayed. I ain't having any problem with that coming off. But if y'all look, that's a much more intense black color on the thing. So if we got a piece and we can't afford Gaboon Albany, what do we do? We go buy a can of albinizing pigment dye, and we make our own. And it's much cheaper. You can make hundreds of boards foot of Albany. Y'all look on both sides of those and, and it'll give you an ideal. But that was just some uh, off-the-cuff research I started doing, trying to figure out how to albinize wood. Every once in a while I get in the shop and play around like that. You, you learn things by doing it. Sometimes it's, you learn that that don't work. <laughs> okay, but so you still learn something. All right. Persimmon is one of our really hard woods in Texas here. And uh, persimmon, persimmon, 
Persimmon is almost as hard as Albany, but not quite. They used to make driver, golf club drivers out of it. It's so hard. It actually turns pretty while it's green, but, boy, you got to do it before it dries. It gets really hard. It's a uh, grain is very straight. Uh, you don't get much wild grain out of it. But uh, it is something you all know, consider. And there is persimmon trees. Well, you can see the map up there where the naturalized area is. I had recently got one up here by Bonham, Texas. And we've been playing around doing some things. In fact, the, in the samples, you'll see that piece of uh, persimmon in that bowl on the thing. Next slide. Hardness test. This gives you an idea of what we've been talking about, about softwoods versus hardwoods, about what we can turn. A Janka test is they shoot a steel ball or a piece of wood, and they measure how far it went in there. It basically tells you the hardness of it, which also translates to when you try to cut it, how good your cutting edge is going to penetrate it on the thing. So I have made you all a play pretty here. These are the hardest woods in Texas. They start at the top with the Janka scale, Texas Albany. The next, you know what's funny? The next hardest wood in Texas is a little, huh? Mesquite is up there, but live oak is harder than mesquite. Yeah, I don't have a piece of live oak, guys, so I'm just going to have to tell you about live oak. But li they used to make, take live oak trees and make ship planking out of it because live oak has a couple of unique characteristics. One, it is very strong wood. It's also very shock resistant and flexible. So they'd put it on the boards on the bow of a ship. Then if you run on the rocks, it had some resistance to those rocks crushing the planks because it's one of the hardest, strongest woods we got. So again, if you're going to turn it uh, live oak, turn it green. I had cut some pieces a few years ago and brought them home round. I laid them down and then forgot about them for a month or two. And they crack. They're real bad about cracking as they dry. So Take some precautions with live oak trees. Anyway, back to the play pretty. This is your Janka scale, and this shows how hard on the test scale, and I showed you that graft. But what this is is, is your pointed gouge. Y'all sit and poke this all you want to, and you can see how hard it is to get your tool to go in these woods once they dry. So y'all play with that and gouge on it all you want to. We're going to get to that. We're... we're Coming up. <laughs> All right. Uh, these are some of our kind of softer woods in our sycamores and sweet gum and hackberry. Of course, ash is not necessarily soft when it's through, but it's a beautiful wood. Uh, sycamore is very prominent through east and south Texas. And if, if you go anywhere east, you're going to find lots of big sycamores. It's very prominent. Uh, it's What's nice about it, if you look at this grain here, it has this really funny grain if you do it quarter sawn, and that, that's taking it on the side grain. If you look on the flat grain, it's, you don't see it. You see it when you go on the side grain of the piece of wood. It makes a gorgeous platter or bowl, and it's soft and easy to turn. Some of the bad characteristics sick more. Don't bother cutting a piece of lumber out of it. You take a 10-foot board of, of sycamore that's a foot wide, and you cut it, and you come back and look at it a week later, it's going to look like a corkscrew. Well, next time it gets it rains, it's going to corkscrew the other way. <laughs> Nobody uses sycamore for lumber, but it makes beautiful bowls. Be prepared for the wood movement. But think what we do. We, we turn a bowl, then we seal it. So now we've limit, limited the amount of moisture that goes in it. Therefore, it's not going to warp the thing. But it has a beautiful characteristics. Here's some of the characteristics on the backs here you can see. Thanks. So sycamore is a great wood. Need to try out. Do some of it. Ash. There's a green ash and a white ash. White ash is usually what you see them make lumber out of. There's more green ash around because we brought it in with a nursery trade. There's green ash native to far east Texas, but we brought them in here. Almost every nursery you can go get a green ash tree to plant in your front yard. Now, but a problem about a green ash, if anybody's ever grown one, you plant it now, 25 years later, it dies, rots out, limbs fall off of it, very short-lived tree. But the wood is just wonderful for turning. Here's a piece of it. And we make tool handles out of them because one is beautiful, but also it's strong wood, it's hard. 
great. They use a lot to make chairs with because of the wood characteristics on the thing. So, how many people has cut a, 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 a made something out of ash lately? Who hasn't made something out of ash? You, there you go. <laughs> All right, hackberry. They call it sugar hackberry or sugar berry hackberry. We all usually just call it hackberry, right? They call it sugar berry because on the leaf of it, they have these little knots. Those actually are sweet. That's why the birds grab them and eat them and then fly a few miles and then drop them. And that's why we got hackberry on every fence line in Texas. If you go out and look at Bob Bar fence, there are hackberry trees growing up, up it. But hackberry is not a bad wood. When you first cut the tree, it's white, very bone white wood. This piece of wood is from a, a tree that we cut down just two months ago. Do y'all see it's brown? It's got very unique characteristics. It starts getting brown up the grain, and it's kind of a spalding that happens internally, I don't think. But it has some real unique grain structure to it. So next time you see a lowly old hackberry tree, cut your chunk down and try to make something out of it. See if you like what it looks like. All along East Texas, we have lots of sweet gum. Starting just a little bit east of here. Sweet gum has a little problem. See how the dry cracks on this piece of wood? You got to dry it properly or it cracks out or turn it green and seal it up real quick and allow it to uh, contract. But the other thing about it is it spalls very good. So sweet gum is another one you may want to try to work with. You, like a lot of woods, you have, each wood you kind of have to figure out how to work with. So don't quit at one piece because it didn't work. Work your way down. Here's all those woods together. How many pin turners we have in here? One, so hold your hands up now. One, two, three, four. This guy here has been raising his hand all night and I didn't recognize him. The guy in the gray t-shirt back there, there's you a selection of pin turning blanks. I've been talking about bowls and vases. We can rip any of this wood down and make pins out of it. It makes great pins. Same characteristics that hold for a bowl, holds for uh, a pin. We're going to talk about colored woods. And what are our colors? We've already talked about walnut. That's our black wood. We got a red wood here in Texas. I got a prize for somebody to answer this question. The red wood in Texas is called a, we, we call it a red cedar mostly, right? But it's really a, raise your hand. Whoever's got the answer. Yes. No. Red cedar is a common name we call it, but it's really a east. It's eastern, but that's not the real thing. Somebody else, you're getting close. There you go. Eastern red cedar is the name, but it's actually of the juniper family. Let me pass this back to that young man. Looks great. We turned a vase. I'll show you. Well, there it is right there. See that vase on the right on the top? We turned that vase out of a red cedar. John's going to talk about the allergies with this. You won't put your dust mask on when you turn it. But, but the unique characteristics is this. you got a knot. Red cedar flows like water around every knot. If you look at that vase picture, if you look at it you will closely, you'll see how the grain comes up and just flows around all the knots. Creates some fantastic interest points. You turn the vase, every piece of your vase, every quarter turn of your vase looks like a whole new vase because of those characteristics. Try turning some red cedar into vases. Pin blanks. That's a red cedar pin. I'm going to pass that around. Look at that. Stop and use red cedar for some stuff. That's got a little burl in it, part of it, which is where it's stretched around a knot on a thing. But uh, it makes it gorgeous pins. Great product to do it. Bottle stoppers. How many in here have turned bottle stoppers? All right, somebody that had hair. Back there in a red T-shirt that's helping so much. Here, 
Here's some bottle stopper wood. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah. It makes a good bowl. I'm going to talk about something else. See, this, I handed him a piece of red cedar. Notice that's not so red. It gets dull over time, so seal it real quick away from air and water, uh, air and sunlight on the thing. Mulberry, common old fruiting mulberry. Every landscape in Dallas, old landscape, has a fruitless mulberry in the front yard, right? And if it's native, it's going to be a fruiting mulberry. Very beautiful yellowish wood. Notice the difference between texture between a board arc and it. This is kind of more, like I was talking about pine. The, the grain is wider. But it's a beautiful wood. Why aren't y'all turning down a mulberry? It's everywhere. It's cheap. People cut them down all the time. Go go get pick up some pieces of it on the thing. And then one of the trees that's unique to Texas, board arc. Did y'all know the first board arc tree ever discovered was up here just on the other side of Bonham, Texas? That's the original board arc tree for the United States. There is a book out written by a professor at, at the University of Commerce that is worth reading because it's full of Texas history and talks about the board arc tree. There was a canyon up there, and the Indians used to travel as much as 400 miles away to come get board arc limbs to make bows because board arc has a very unique characteristic. If you make a bow and you draw the bow back, when you release it, all the wood, the wood goes back to its original form, and it releases it faster than any other wood. In other words, the bow will shoot an arrow faster on the thing. And that's why you some of these traditional, if you all know any traditional archery people, are always wanting board arc blanks. There you go. There we go back back. It has some unique characteristics on the thing. Our characteristic for wood turners usually is because it's yellow, right? So, beautiful. If you can find it where... Board arc typically don't grow straight. Watch the limbs. They'll go up, and then they'll just take a right turn. Get the right turn. Because what that does is that makes this burl look, too. Where they stress that wood, where it turns, makes those odd angles, makes a beautiful piece of wood for a pin, a bowl, or whatever. So cut those off and save them. Board arc gets hard when it's dry, so you need to turn it green. But it's beautiful wood. Look at some of those. If you want something of a color, think about those four woods as coloring your piece automatically just because of the wood you use. I'm talking about this, cedar. This is a piece of old cedar, about four years old. See, it's not red anymore. It's brown. Here's a piece of cherry. I made that segmented bowl about four years ago. You see how dark the cherry is. This piece of cherry I cut before I come here. That's what that looked like four years ago. Cherry darkens with age. That's why a lot of really old cherry antique furniture is highly prized because it's got this dark patina to it. And that's how you notice fake woods, you know, where they, somebody's tried to fake to look like cherry, or you notice they fix something with new cherry because that's new cherry. It'll eventually look like that, though. So be aware that any of these colored woods are going to fade. Now, here's one of the characteristics. I passed around that piece. Board arc, cherry. Oh, cherry gets darker. Uh, board arc, mulberry, red cedar primarily. The color will fade with time and with air and sunlight. It'll fade to kind of a brown. So the only way you can prevent that is as soon as you turn it, you seal it. That gets the air off of it. If you're going to have it exposed to any kind of sunlight, you need to use a UV protection like marine varnish on it. should be the only finish you put on those woods if you want them to hold their color because it's got UV inhibitors in, in marine varnish. None of the other things we use will, will stop that from happening. But yet, cherry and black walnut, with age, they get darker. Probably something you want to happen, right? Black walnut is going to be blacker with age. Cherry will be darker with age. So you can see how it changes. Just take a look at the, the, how much that changes as it goes. By the way, that's a hard maple accent ring on that. You can give you a little idea of the, the color differences on thing. About four years ago. 
All right, board art. Let me mention this for a pass. We was up my friend's up bottom, and he had those cedar trees down, so we were collecting some of the cedar trees, red cedar. This is a split rail board art post that's been in the ground 65 years. I want you all to look at the wood versus how much rotted. <laughs> hardly nothing. In 65 years, hardly nothing has rotted on that board art. And there's a living example. We've heard this. I know a lot of people heard this or read it. There's your example right there. Here is where the cherry go. I'm sorry. Here's another cherry bowl that's only been chaired two years. Kind of put it with that cherry, if you would, back there. And you can see the, the contrast. Hey, it's much lighter still. Hadn't got as dark as the other one. All right. Somebody tell me the uh, number two cabinet grade highest quality wood we've got in the United States to turn something out of or make a cabinet out of. Okay, well, we walnut. We talked about walnut a while ago, right? So that's not it. The most premier wood we have in the United States, other than walnut, to make cabinets and stuff. Mahogany's not a United States. There's a winner back there. Cherry. Have you got a? I hope you ain't got a mini lathe. <laughs> Go home, turn your beautiful cherry bowl out of that. <sighs> that could even be a natural edge bowl if you want it to be. <sighs> Is that me making all that noise? <laughs> Oops, sorry, guys. I don't think. Um, all right, let's talk about some more. Uh, these are all... Black cherry only grows a little bit here in Texas. I tell you, I just go ahead and flip through the first slide on the thing. Black cherry is okay. There's only a few areas in Texas that supposedly black cherry is native. I personally have never seen a, a cherry tree in those areas, but I hadn't walked every foot of woods either. That come from some of the Texas forestry people. But as soon as you go across into northern Louisiana or uh, Arkansas, you see a lot of cherry. So... That is a wood that you can uh, find pretty easy. What we're talking about here on this particular platter is fine grain woods. Woods that you would make very small objects out of and you wanted to not see coarse grain like a red oak tree. You want something fine. And we have a lot of trees do that. And cherry is one of them. It's, it's a basically a fruit wood. Black cherry is basically the fruit wood. Yeah, everybody ta heard talk about apple wood. Well, those are fruit woods. Pear, Bradford pear is a fruit wood. It's from a fruitless pear. All of your fruit type trees, you see somebody cutting down a peach tree. Any of your fruit trees are good to get very fine grain wood out of, fine textured woods. It's usually somewhat soft, but it also is very fine grain for certain projects. Uh, black cherry is one of them. Uh, in, like I said, you can go east and get a lot of it. Next slide. Catapa. Look at the Texas thing. It's only native to a certain piece of Texas. But we all know we see catapa trees everywhere. Yes? Very last. Okay. I'll get there. <laughs> uh, catapa trees, if y'all don't know what a catapa tree is, they grow very big, very quickly. They have huge green leaves. They look like almost like you're in the, in the rainforest or something. And they put out flyers in the summer. They do that for about 10 or 15 years, then they start to fall apart. They got dead wood on them and look very ragged toward this time of year, like September right now. It'll look very ragged. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the fishermen used to plant them because there's this top of worm gets on it. This guy's shaking his head. You know what I'm Huge green worms. And they used to raise the top of trees just to go get the worms out of it to go fishing. So they catch bigger fish. The top of wood's beautiful. Fine grain, kind of a brown. Look at what happens when you put a finish on it. Y'all y'all take time to touch the, the finish on these and just feel that grain. Your fingers are a very good guide to, to texture on your wood. Uh, there's a lot of catapa trees around, and we've come across some 
ones we were able to harvest here lately. But you just have to wait for somebody to cut one down. Some of your best bets is when they're clearing a lot from an old house and they're going to build a new house. And there's no 50s or 60 model house on that lot that they're dozing. There's a lot of times there's a catapa tree there you can get your hands on. Bradford pear. Back of the slides here. Catapa, <sighs> just more on information on it. Well, crepe myrtle. Let's, let's talk about crepe myrtle a little bit. We have crepe myrtles. And crepe myrtles is not native to Texas. Is everybody, or even the United States, is everybody aware of that? You don't, because it was brought in here in 1790 from China into Charleston, South Carolina, and it was such a hit, everybody spread them across the United States. I, when I was first getting in the nursery trade, I used to have a nursery growing operation, and I'd go to Texas A&M. They would tell me that there was American crepe myrtle, supposedly, that was native to here, and then the Japanese ones, which were those short crepe myrtles. American ones were real tall when it's 20, 30 feet tall. Well, after doing a little research, I figured out that all of them come from China. There was never a, a native crepe myrtle. But here, here's what's interesting about crepe myrtles. One, it's a very fine grain wood, a lot of texture to it, great to make things out of. Go around one of these places where they're clearing a lot, you can get some big pieces of crepe myrtle that they're dozing down trees and stuff. And here's the thing. I showed you all those foreign woods. Did you know some of our unscrupulous wood or foreign wood things are selling this stuff as Asian satin wood. There is actually an East Indy satin wood. There's a West Indy satin wood. Next slide. That's when it was brought in. Next slide. There you go. Crepe myrtle is a first cousin to uh, East Indian satin woods. Very distant first cousin, but it has a lot of the same characteristics. So be careful when you're buying satin wood. You may not be getting the real thing. The way you'll notice East Indian satin wood is going to cost you a lot of money. If you're getting a, a, a cheap deal on it, it's probably crepe myrtle. You can get that here. So... Look at crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle is a great wood to do fine grain work with. How, how many people knew that? All right, I guess you get the piece of wood. Anybody else knew that? <laughs> there, this guy hadn't won anything. When that wood gets to you, that's yours. <laughs> that piece of crepe myrtle. Uh, all right, American holly. Holly grows in East Texas. What's unique about holly? This is shows Hollywood, American holly. Now we have Bradford, uh, I mean, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, Dwarf Buford holly is in the nursery trade. That's not, it, it'll turn, but you just can't get a big enough piece for it. But out in East Texas, there's these holly trees, and you'll find some of them, they usually just call them big holly or, or uh, just ilexes, which is a Latin name for them. But they'll grow into huge trees, and they might be 30 feet tall. The, you, if you see something that's got a holly leaf on it and it's over 10 foot tall, it's probably an American holly. And it's a great wood. Characteristics of it is very fine grain, usually white. Do you all see that this has got blue in it? If you go harvest this in the summer when the sap's up, as soon as you cut it, there's a fungus will turn it blue. You go in the dead of the winter and you cut holly, and it'll be bone white. So harvest it at the appropriate time, and it'll be a lot whiter. A lot of people like to turn fine nails and stuff out of it. It also takes stain real well if you want to color it some color. So holly is a great wood that's from Texas to turn things out of. How many people knew that about holly? Whoever's used holly for anything? Now you've already won. You had not won anything, have you? All right, there's a piece of holly to take home and play with. <sighs> who else is it? Who else knew that about holly? That holly was a great wood to turn stuff out of. Who hadn't won back there? Huh? <laughs> that guy hadn't won. <laughs> You're a pin turner. Knew what? Be an awful skinny snowman, <laughs> but do some horse trading with the other guy. 
Because they can charge for it? <laughs> I don't have any trouble getting Holly. The first Holly that I got, I went down to Athens, Texas. This is before I had a sawmill. And so I had to haul some wood down to Athens, Texas. And this guy lives five miles outside of Athens in the deep piney woods. And we're standing there in the piney woods, and I'm looking over there, and there's holly trees growing. And these things are huge, 30 feet tall. And I started asking him about it, and he, and he said, yeah, there's holly, uh, holly trees there. He said, I cut this one down last week. You want the whole log? So he just threw it on my trailer for me. That's how valuable it is down in Athens. So find somebody in that area. It, Hollywood don't mean nothing to them. They're knocking down forest or whatever. It grows wild, so just go out there and get one. It's just it's a beautiful wood, though. And, yes, the, nurse, the selling trade tends to value it very highly, but it doesn't need to be. It's one of those we can go get ourselves or get somebody that, that has some of it. I do a lot of horse trading, guys. I, I don't sell a lot of wood. I do do a lot of horse trading. You've got something to trade? I'll get you some holly. <laughs> so I talked a little bit about katapa. Here's a katapa bowl. I want you all to look at that, how beautiful it is if you make turn something out of it. Oh, what do we got left here? We Bradford down to Bradford Pear. Um, Bradford Pear. It's a fruit wood, right? It's, it's a pear tree. It uh, just happens to be a fruitless pear. Anybody know where the first one come from? <laughs> That's a good guess as any. I don't know. I thought somebody else knew the answer. <laughs> They're in the nursery trades, all I know, and we got them all over this Metroplex in, in the area. There is a lot of Bradford pear. Again, plant them, grows 25 years, starts falling apart, and everybody's cutting them down. They're laying on the curb. Grab all you can of that. It makes great, fine, because it's so fine textured. It's beautiful, uh, the kind of stuff it makes out of it. So get you some of it. 